Welcome to this episode of Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Frederico Precora here from Örebro, Univer Örebro University. Uh, and we're going to talk about everything in robotics like we usually do. And we're going to start also where we usually do. How did you get into the field? What was your start in robotics? Mm. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, how did I get into robotics? Well, my background is in artificial intelligence, actually. So I did my PhD in what we call planning and scheduling which is, uh, uh, well, essentially they're AI algorithms that help you decide or help a computer uh, or an artificial system in general decide what to do and when to do it. Mm. Um, and soon I became interested in, uh, well, actually doing things and, um, and in fact doing things in the context of a perceived real world, uh, a world that needs to be perceived by the program that is doing things. Um, and where you must act in the world in order to do these things. And mm. so that's how I got interested in robotics. Mm. And that led me to discover that um, between the um, elegant AI algorithms that uh, are used for planning and scheduling and uh, using them in the real world with a real agent that actually perceives the world and does things, um, there's, there's a bit of a gulf. Um, and there are many open research questions and that's why I'm in robotics today. Mm. And I think I hear that from many people that they they like the fact that the robots are out there in the real world and affecting it and mm -hmm. moving stuff around, moving itself around, both because they can be more useful, but also because uh, it, it's so much more challenging. And yeah. the, the pure computer science and simulation have a common problem. They are bound, they are uh, cursed with with success. In simulation, everything works. Mm -hmm. And then you bring it out to the real world and not so much anymore. And, but that is actually what, what, what gives you the interesting questions and the interesting problems to work on, right? Yeah, and, and I think you, you nailed, you hammered the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is because it's not just a question of engineering mm -hmm. or of re-engineering when it comes to going from simulation or, uh, or theory to practice mm -hmm. and real robots. Uh, because going into the real world and using real robots actually opens up new research questions for AI. Mm -hmm. So lots of the assumptions you make in AI, mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they do not apply to the real world. Um, for instance, that uh, things are done uh, in the time that you've predicted or that the outcome of an action is actually what you expected. Maybe you could even um, do things like um, plan with multiple outcomes, but there's always going to be that next, that other outcome mm. that you haven't planned for. Yeah. So, um, so indeed it is, it is challenging and, and uh, the research questions are pretty basic, mm. they're pretty fundamental <laughs> for AI, mm. I think. Mm. Very interesting. Could you speak about a few of the projects you've been working on uh, since you got into robotics? Sure. Quite a few years ago, I became interested in, um, I would say, service robotics, mm. or the use of robots and uh, ubiquitous mm. sensing and actuation devices mm. uh, at home uh, mm. for, for example, the care of uh, an elderly person, mm. or, or maybe perhaps just for simplifying your life at home or automating mm. your home. Mm. Mm. Um, and um, in this, I, uh, I started studying the issue of uh, making these devices that you have at home um, to some extent proactive mm. um, and contextual. And I can explain what this means by, by uh, uh, contrasting uh, current practice in artificial intelligence and mm. planning mm. with uh, the real world. So um, it is often the case in planning that we say uh, we, we design a program that will be able to come up with a plan to satisfy a goal or to achieve a goal. Mm. For example, um, in the so-called blocks world, you may have heard of this. Mm. Uh, um, it's a hypothetical world where you have blocks and you can stack them and there are letters on the blocks and you can write, you can compose them to say, to write sentences or, mm. or words. Um, this is a, a toy problem, of course. Mm. Uh, and there, you, you, the planning problem is that of given a goal, so a goal configuration of these blocks. Uh, to to compute the actions that will bring about this situation. Mm. This is difficult enough. Mm. And there's tons of work in AI planning for, for doing this. Mm. Uh, but what what often is is disregarded is uh, the reason why 
this goal is being tri is being achieved. Mm -hmm. So why this goal in particular? Why th the equivalent thing in in a um, in a domestic setting would mm -hmm. be? Uh, why should my robot do this for me right now? Mm -hmm. And what is it that my robot should plan to do for me? Mm -hmm. um, all of this is should be contextual. Mm -hmm. It should have something to do with my current context, mm -hmm. with my desires, with um, with what I need right now, mm -hmm. with things that are observed in the environment. So there's a connection there between the goal for which you are planning mm -hmm and um, what can be perceived and inferred from the environment. Mm, mm, mm. Um, so there are at least two interesting open questions here that I, I began looking at. One was how to infer these goals, so how to infer the objective that the artificial robotic system, uh, or artificial system in general, is, is going to um, um, try to achieve for you. Mm. And also the sub-problem of figuring out what the current context is from sensor traces. Mm. So how to infer um, whether you are in need of a particular service mm. and, and when that is. Mm -hmm. Without you telling the robot specifically that I want you to do X and at that time, exactly, right? Exactly. It should look at the situation. And we humans do that sometimes, that we just look at the situation and I think now it's appropriate to do this, right? Yes, in fact, we are, I think, very good at uh, understanding context and mm -hmm. uh, and even projecting the the kind of um, or projecting uh, into the future, understanding the situation of others. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a notion of uh, the needs of others and not just of ourselves, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, and these are qualities that you expect to have in a robot system that helps you at home. Mm, mm. Um, and in fact, you expect to have this in a robot system that, that works with humans in any context, not mm. just the domestic context. Mm, mm. Um, so that is also how I, I started to get into um, then industrial robots, mm. and uh, or rather robots that are used in, in industrial settings. Mm. Uh, such as the ones you saw over here, the mm. the, um, the forklifts that uh, that coordinate. Mm, it's a pallet mover that thus moves industrial supplies and other things automatically. Huh? Exactly. Yes, and and here <coughs> also you have an issue related to um, making robots more than uh, you know simply automated caddies that bring stuff around. Mm or automated trucks that can go from A to B. Yeah. Also there, when you, when you send, let's take something as simple as a, um, as a forklift, <gasps> an automated forklift or an, an autonomous forklift yeah. that can be told to go from here to there. Yeah. Um, so that's all good and well. Uh, but the problem here is when a, fork, a forklift may need to go to a certain place to do one thing yeah. um, or to do another thing, and what, what it's doing will alter the way uh, the movement is, is performed even. Mm -hmm. For instance, if the forklift is to pick up a pallet, mm -hmm. um, the specific alignment of the, um, of the forks of the mm -hmm. forklift mm -hmm. are very important because otherwise you'll miss the pallet. Mm -hmm. um, and that in turn requires going to the place where you think the pallet is, mm -hmm. observing the pallet, mm -hmm. realigning, which in turn requires maneuvering because these forklifts are not omnidirectional platforms. Mm. They mm. Um, they have to plan that within their own limitation space. So exactly, speak, yeah. and in doing so, in maneuvering, they may interfere with other forklifts in the fleet, mm. uh, which may have to yield for uh, um, letting this forklift perform this maneuver to realign itself, and so mm. on. Mm. So, in that context, the context mm. of picking up a pallet. Mm. Um, that's the movement occurs in this way, and it's got to be precise, mm -hmm. and it has to interleave sensing and replanning. Mm -hmm. um, if instead the forklift is going somewhere to drop a pallet, mm -hmm. it may not be so important. Mm -hmm. In that case, you can get away with uh, roughly reaching the area where you want to put the pallet mm -hmm. and putting it down. Mm -hmm. So even there, there is an issue of context mm -hmm. uh, and understanding context and within which you execute a plan. Mm. And this also means that the maneuvering of a, of, of a robot that picks up a pallet is more crucial to the system than the one that, that one that is just driving by or one that is dropping off. And they have to then coordinate among each other and say, well, since you're doing this, I have more priority because I'm doing that. And for us to achieve the complete task together, 
this is how we do it, right? That may that is indeed often the case. Um, mm. You uh, you're mentioning another interesting um, issue that I've sort of it's it's been a, a bit of a recent um, uh, I won't say discovery, but a but a recent realization that yeah. uh, exactly what is relevant and uh, what parts of the context you should consider and how the um, relative importance of tasks that a multi-robot system is carrying out yeah. um, is, is um, what the relevant importance is like uh, really depends on the application scenario and uh, that's also another place where AI techniques sort of break down because um, very often um, assumptions are made mm -hmm. and these assumptions work in one very specific application but not in another. Mm -hmm. uh, so another challenge I believe, um, a very current challenge for AI and its use for robotics, especially in these industrial settings, uh, is to, to somehow um, be modular and general. Mm. Um, it should be, we should be capable of rendering single robots autonomous we should be, and by and large, I think we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, we should be capable of making fleets yeah. autonomous, but without constraining them to a particular application context. Yeah. So we should be able to automate an entire fleet of robots like we automate a single robot, like yeah. we make a single robot autonomous. And this is a bit, a bit more, it's in reach, but it's still not really achieved, at least not in a general way. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, we need to be able to build more uh, intelligence, uh, for example, to run our warehouses mm -hmm. or to run our mines or quarries mm -hmm. or fleets of trucks mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And these mm -hmm. things should be somehow, it should be, we should be developing methods that allow us to interchange techniques to achieve these layers of competency or these layers of, uh, of autonomy mm -hmm. from single to many to the logic layer on top of a fleet. And, and of course also here we talked about two two robots or uh, multiple robots doing more or less the same task, moving a pallet. Mm. But in a real world context, they would also be doing very different tasks. Yeah, yeah. Mm. In fact, uh, there are some some projects that I, well, there's one project that I, that I work in. Uh, it's a project that's coordinated by Edinburgh University, but it's a large European project that involves um, many partners, uh, academic and industrial, is, mm. is the use of um, or the automation of warehouses, mm -hmm. uh, and it deals with everything from the perception to the um, uh, motion planning and to the fleet control. Mm -hmm. uh, and there we see exactly what you say. So we have um, already in a food manufacturing scenario where they use such robotic platforms, mm -hmm. you not only need to bring pallets of goods around, mm -hmm. you may have to palletize and depalletize these goods, mm -hmm. which entails you must have specific tools on, on board the forklift perhaps to cut the cellophane around the, mm -hmm. the goods on top of the pallet. Mm -hmm. Or you may need a, an actuator in order to take goods off the pallet and put them on another pallet and then mm -hmm. bring that pallet somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And also you have different types of or different areas in a warehouse mm -hmm. where maybe you're bringing things into a cold area and you need to maximize the time in which those things remain in that cold area because mm. yogurt spoils if it's in, not mm. in a cold area. And other times you're just bringing uh, cartons around and mm. it really doesn't matter. Mm. So, so yes, indeed. And, and the name of the game here is not to make an ad hoc uh, implementation, which is always possible. Mm. Uh, even an ad hoc automated implementation of all of this is more than possible if you throw mm. enough money at it. Mm. Uh, the problem is to make this general so that even the small warehouse or even the you know, you don't have to be Amazon mm. to uh, to be able to automate mm. your operations. Mm. Uh, mm. That's that's the um, I think a very interesting uh, area to 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 be in, a, and a very interesting application for robotics and AI because it forces the robots to be more intelligent mm. and the systems built around them to be more applicable in a wider variety of contexts, mm. which is in fact uh, I think. Um, um, is directly related to the level of intelligence that you put into your systems, I would say. Mm. And the, the, we all know that the ad hoc solution really hurts you in the long run to... Yeah, well actually um, the solutions we're studying now uh, for automating fleets of warehouse robots mm. um, are also applied and we also actively work with companies in this mm. area 
um, in mining, mm -hmm. uh, in construction sites, mm -hmm. in quarries. Um, they automate fleets of robots that can be forklifts like the mm -hmm. ones you saw, small objects, mm -hmm. small robots. Mm -hmm. uh, but the same, exactly the same technique applies to and has been used with uh, 14 meter long, 20 meter tall drill rigs mm -hmm. developed by EpiRock mm -hmm. um, and currently operating in, in uh, surface mines around the world. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, I think that that is a level of gener generality, mm -hmm. let's say that, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, th then it becomes interesting. Then it's what I deem uh, to be artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. um, more so, let's say, than an ad hoc, completely engineered mm. solution for a particular mm. warehouse where you've modified the floor mm. and you've assumed that robots move on a grid, mm. uh, which is, for the scale that Amazon does things, impressive and very interesting, of course. Mm. Uh, but, but in long term, it's not uh, it's not an interesting solution to a wider problem. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. And it also becomes even on an Amazon level, very expensive to do an ad hoc solution. Because if you're talking about us running this in factories, warehouses, mines, agriculture, even yeah. all of these fields, the development cost, even if basic research is expensive, productization is expensive, yeah. when you do it over this vast area of human activity, it becomes a round off error for these businesses, right? Yes, for sure. You mentioned agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's logical to think that oh well now my solution could be applied to an agricultural setting where you have say multiple harvesters mm -hmm. um, or the harv the, the combine harvester and the truck that picks up the grain exactly right? exactly and this is exactly the scenario that that we've a scenario that we've looked at mm -hmm. uh, but then there are a few a few wrinkles in it that make it a bit different mm -hmm. right and uh, and these often open up a door mm -hmm. that is behind which lies a, a, a very basic research problem. Mm -hmm. So in, in open pit mining, mm -hmm. our coordination solutions, um, or rather the coordination problem is, or the, multi, the fleet management problem is difficult mm -hmm. because robots move around in a tight environment. They're very big, mm -hmm. they're cumbersome, uh, but also they drill holes in the ground mm. and once a hole is drilled that area becomes inaccessible mm. Hence the motion planning problem in fact the multi-robot motion planning problem and coordination mm. problem is getting more and more constrained mm. as the operations progress mm. and so you can easily see how this uh, renders the problem of even deciding which target to assign to which robot so which robot should go and drill which hole and mm. when mm. Uh, is also part of this gigantic combinatorial problem. Mm. So that's that's one type of problem that's that's uh, unique and mm. novel in terms of the AI mm. uh, techniques that can solve it. And we developed some of these techniques. Mm. Then you think, okay, well, harvesting is similar, right? Because once you've harvested a piece of mm. a field. Mm. Uh, you, you you should no longer go there, mm. and in fact, you really shouldn't because you would increase soil compaction mm. if you go over a place more times, and so mm. on and so forth. But it is different from the surface mining because in surface mining, these obstacles are discrete; mm. they're they're blobs that appear mm. where mm. you've drilled a hole, mm. but you can still navigate around them. Mm. Instead, everything becomes continuous in a field. Mm. So this slight, this small difference mm. uh, renders the techniques developed for the former problem mm. less applicable for mm. the latter, or less efficient or mm. even inapplicable. Mm. So that's why what I enjoy in, in looking at applications, it, because they, they, they open doors behind which there's some questions that no AI researcher has looked at. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find and interesting. And that brings us back to the being robots are out there in the real world doing real tasks, right? Uh, and uh, that hard constraint of we have to accomplish this task also kind of disciplines you and, and, and re really have to. And I, I find those constraint problems interesting because drilling a hole, um, it's also so that you can't paint yourself in a corner there because if you can't remove the drill from the work site, you can't blow the, the rock up because then the, exactly. the drill would come by and uh, will be destroyed. And, and if we're looking at the, the harvest problem, uh, you can absolutely not drive where there is unharvested crop because then you destroy it. Yeah. Uh, so you have to, you have to 
everything have to drive whether it's already harvested, which means that the har the combine goes in and kind of cuts a hole, yeah. uh, and then everybody's got to move in that little hole, and then of course the harvester goes around and expands that, and as you say, soil compaction is a huge issue. Yes. So we might even keep track of where the where a vehicle has been and not go in the same place. So. Everywhere where somebody's been is the place we want to avoid. Exactly. And that, so we, we can kind of average out the soil compaction over the field. And this is something that a human would find quite challenging of, of knowing exactly where, where I was, even year from year or from, from um, yeah. seeding the field to harvesting the field to, to treating the field during, during the, the, the growing season. But we could actually optimize this over this uh, in this context, and I find that that's really the opportunity for robotics and AI, right? Yes, indeed. And um, in fact, you, you since you mentioned the harvesting, I mm. think another interesting uh, small detail, mm. uh, but very relevant for someone who studies AI, is mm. uh, whereas in harvesting you may have an optimization problem. Mm. Uh, that's the major problem you mm. want to solve because mm. perhaps you can't avoid going over a part of the field more than once. No. Uh, but but nevertheless, you want mm. to minimize soil mm. compaction. Um, in a similar application, mm. like uh, multi-robot painting, mm. let's say you're you're painting a soccer field, yeah. or, or you're painting some design with mm. a robot that paints, mm. and this could have applications like uh, road uh, painting or mm. whatever. Mm. Um, there, you're not so much looking at an optimization problem, although there may be some opti some things mm. to optimize. Mm. But there, you really can't go over no. something that you've just painted. Mm. Um, so there, uh, you're really looking at finding a solution, mm. whatever solution it mm. is. And, then, and the techniques that you use in these two contexts vary widely. So mm. if you need to optimize, um, it's really one set of techniques that you'll be using. You'll be looking at perhaps local search methods mm. or um, anyway, methods that, that take into account some cost or constrained mm. optimization methods. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking at uh, satisfaction problems, mm -hmm. you're looking other at other forms of perhaps systematic search that is heuristically guided mm -hmm. or things like that. And, and that's mm -hmm. also interesting to see these subtleties in the application mm -hmm. which drastically change the approach that you take as an AI mm -hmm. researcher. Now we've talked about these projects, do you have any other things you'd like to share from, from your work at the university? Yes, one of these, one thing that I haven't mentioned is um, these projects or one of these projects mm -hmm. is in fact a research profile. Mm -hmm. um, here in Sweden we're lucky to, we're lucky enough to have um, significant amounts of funding uh, nationally, I would say. Mm. Um, one of these funders is uh, Koko Stiftelsen, mm. um, and they fund a research profile called Semantic Robots, mm. uh, which is the profile, the research profile within which y we've done this multi robot mm. uh, coordination work. Um, but within this profile, we also look at the other accessory mm. um, or, or the other problems surrounding the, the automation of robots in industrial use cases. Mm. Um, and, uh, and these range from perception uh, to uh, control mm. um, and semantic perception and semantic mapping and, and, and things of that sort. Um, and what I think is a bit unique uh, is the fact that we have on board experts in robotics mm. and experts in AI mm. um, in fields as disparate as um, machine learning, uh, heuristic search, mm. um, planning and, and scheduling and so on. Um, and this is really um, important. Mm. Uh, I, I, I've come to believe that it's very difficult to have an impact in, in, in the real world, I mm. would say, um, if you don't have um, access to these very complementary expertise mm, mm. Uh, or s sets of expertise mm. um, and uh, enabling discussion between a roboticist and an AI researcher mm. is is not easy mm. um, but but when done right I would say the yield is is uh, uh, is very interesting and it's, it's very um, it, it 
it gives more than the sum of its parts. We've, we've talked about the industrial setting, we've talked about agriculture, but are you also working with robots that will interact with, with humans? Yes. Uh, in, For instance, in a hospital or in a supermarket or something like that? Yes, we have had and still have several projects in this direction. Mm. Um, in the past, we've looked very much at domestic robots, as I said before. Mm. Um, and and in this particular case, I've worked personally with, with robots that... Uh, uh, plan contextually, so understand mm. w- what goal to achieve uh, from context and mm. from sensor traces. Mm. Um, more recently, we've been looking at the use of uh, robots for elder care, um, and there, in particular, uh, of course, understanding of context is key there, mm. um, because um, the argument goes that if if your smart home or your or some AI device connected to, to your home mm. is capable of, of understanding your context and mm. inferring higher level um, knowledge about mm. um, how you're doing, mm-hmm. um, then that can be used for prevention, it can be used for signal, signaling things to doctors, mm. it can simply be used for more self-awareness of, mm. of how someone's health and habits are changing with age and that can mm. be uh, instrumental in, in raising quality of life. Mm. Um, even more recently, we've been looking at how robots that interact with people, mm. and of course, human robot interaction is paramount in these domestic like settings. Mm. Um, and we've been looking at how robots that interact with people can do so in a culturally sensitive way. Mm, mm. Um, this is via a project called Caresses, mm. um, which is a cooperation between several EU partners mm. um, and uh, several Japanese partners. Um, and here the, the challenge is to um, understand how a human uh, or how a, a robot, which is conceived for human mm. robot interaction, mm. um, uh, can be easily customized to uh, work in different cultural settings. Mm. Uh, the robot in question here is uh, the uh, SoftBank mm. Aldebaran Pepper robot, mm. which mm. you may have seen. Mm. Um, and that's the sort of the test bed robot that we're mm. thinking that we're looking at. Mm. Um, and in fact, SoftBank Robotics is one of the partners of the project. Mm. Um, and uh, the idea is that so you have a Pepper and um, you want to deploy this pepper in, mm. I don't know, a nursing home mm. um, in England mm. um, on one hand, or mm. a, um, a nursing context or nursing home in Japan. Mm. Um, and already in this very narrow setting, mm. uh, although the robots will be doing by and large the same thing or the mm. same kind of tasks, mm. they will be interacting in different ways with their users for mm. obvious reasons mm. um, and the question of the project is how to capture this cultural knowledge, mm. uh, how to model it mm. in into the robot, how to allow the robot to go from preconceived cultural knowledge about a, uh, a stereotyped set of users to individual knowledge about one user, mm. so learning this over time, mm. um, and how to do this in such a way that uh, the deployment Cost or the p- deployment process is as easy as possible. M- more or less self-learning, automated. Uh, a little bit, yes. Yeah. I mean, for you and me, it's uh, if you know that when you give your business card to an Asian person, mm. you do it with two hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something that you've picked up mm. by ob- observing, or maybe mm. someone told you once. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you know, you you that's you the will way continue you do it to there. do it. And here we do it. That here you way. do it in another way. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, and this seems very simple for us mm. humans. Mm. Uh, but for robots, building mechanisms that allow robots to exploit this kind of knowledge mm. and learn this knowledge mm. and distinguish stereotype knowledge from individual knowledge mm. um, is also important in an open research question. Mm. But this also will make the robot f- feel more naturally, feel more like it's not uh, a robot. It will feel more like it's act- interacting with you in a natural fashion, right? I mean, we're we're really making the first baby steps, mm. I think, in this direction. Today, mm. we still see robots. We anthropomorphize robots mm. still mm. in a way that we don't anthropomorphize other a objects. Toaster of, a toaster or a coffee machine. Exactly. Mm. Um, however, I don't know. There, there was an episode of a, of a series where they were talking about a Xerox copying machine mm. in the 50s. Mm. Mad Men. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there, okay, it was sh- short of anthropomorphization. It was... 
uh, they were treating this this object much mm. more like a, like um, like it had some kind of soul, mm. you know, something like that. So mm. as time goes by, our our attitudes towards robots will change, mm. I believe, mm -mm. and and that entails that uh, that maybe some of the things that we're you know really toying with today and 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 trying to some of the problems we're trying to solve today will be less relevant in the future mm. who knows as our attitudes change towards robots and we get used to them mm. uh, we will seek different behaviors from robots today a printer copier doesn't have to have a design that that just gives you this personality or anything and uh, and also they don't have to give us as much cues to how to use them and the limitations yeah. they have because we already know, right? Exactly. I mean, if I ask my copier to make a million copies, I know it won't do that. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's very it's all about expectation. Mm -hmm. And here, though, there is there is an issue of responsibility. Also, mm -hmm. I think of um, producers of of, of 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 products that have AI in them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you make a a car with some AI in it that mm -hmm. will supposedly help you avoid accidents. Um, it's one thing to say this this car has the safety feature, mm -hmm. um, or it's one thing to say that this car has a, a sort of form of assisted driving. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to say that the car is a self-driving car. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, maybe it's exactly the same technology and cars described in these two different ways, but mm -hmm. uh, but the expectation that you have is very different, mm -hmm. and that determines how you interact and and the level of trust that you put then mm. into this car mm, mm. Um, and the same thing same thing holds with other robots as mm. well it's I mean cars are just the most recent example but mm. uh, and we see that people put too much trust in especially the cars well ma maybe maybe the answer is we really really have the answer to mm. this because this is not different from um, for example the time when people didn't wear seat belts mm, mm. I mean Mm. It's just a seat belt, right? Mm. Today it, we take it for granted. I can't even drive on a parking lot in two kilometers. I, exactly, uh, it's, it's, it's ingrained second in nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it didn't used to be. No. And um, this is not. It's not that because there's AI in it mm. that um, it should. We should somehow treat it in a tr or develop new. Um, how can I say new policies or mm. new necessarily new rules? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the way we got people to wear seat belts mm. may be the way in which we get people not to trust their self-driving car or their level three car mm. uh, totally. Mm. I don't know, but mm. um, it's I maybe just to, I, I'm a big believer in information. I mean, yes. tell people about these things, and uh, and instead of laws and regulations, which kind of fills a purpose too but but I think that if you inform people they're gonna take a decision and I think that even if you try to force them the same people are gonna take the same decisions right yeah but informing by them, and large yes and yeah. informing them that crucially as I was saying mm -hmm. before it means uh, not suggesting mm -hmm. that your car is a self-driving car mm -hmm. if it's not no, no right because that's not what you're buying mm -hmm. you don't you're not buying an autopilot mm -hmm. although it may work mm -hmm. as an autopilot mm -hmm. you know but you that's not the contract that mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. uh, if you see what i mean mm -hmm. so um i think there we need some responsibility mm -hmm. from the point of view of vendors mm -hmm. um, it's not over hyping it because that's very dangerous. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another thing that when we did the seatbelt thing, we now have cars that beep if 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 you don't yeah. put the seatbelt on and stuff. But with a, when we introduced these advanced artificial intelligence systems, lots of sensors, we could also make the system um, actually check that you are in compliance with its own parameters because we could install sensors in in the in, in the car mm. that looks at the driver uh, in a more advanced way than just click in 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 your seat belt mm. yeah that, and then uh, that th that system would be kind of self checking that's certainly a thought and i guess some of these systems are in place i mean for example you got you, you need to hold the steering wheel or these kinds mm. of things or even the blink detector mm. and uh, things of this sort mm. um so yeah, that definitely. Uh, I think there there is uh, there is room for some of these uh, these improvements. Um, on the other hand, though, um, 
I think this this uh, leads to another challenge mm. for AI, mm. um, and that I think is is also drastically under addressed. Mm. Um, it's it's often hard for an AI system um, to tell you what it doesn't know. Yeah, for obvious reasons. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's the same for human, actually. The same for humans, mm. but humans have developed ways of coping with this. Uh, lack of observability or lack of knowledge, in mm. fact, mm. Um, that 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 are maybe more sophisticated than than our AI systems. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, uh, if we go back to the car example, a car mm. that uh, um, I can easily imagine, and I've seen examples mm. of cars preventing mm. uh, intelligent cars preventing mm. accidents mm. Absolutely. In, in a way that is absolutely mind-boggling, mm. right? Mm. Uh, so you you wouldn't see from the footage that mm. there's going to be an accident, yet the car starts mm. braking mm. before mm. you can even see it as a human. And mm. I think mm. that's really amazing. But do cars reason about ignorance about knowledge about their environment? I mean, mm. do cars reason about the fact that, well, there's a truck there mm. and that's blocking my view. So mm. if something's mm. happening behind that truck, it could be very dangerous in this mm. situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent this is done mm. and I think this is a more general question that is mm. interesting. Uh, reasoning about what you don't know mm. um, and, and putting this in the context of reasoning online, so mm. doing reasoning while things are happening. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is fascinating mm. and um, a more open research question than others, perhaps, in AI and robotics. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. It's, be, it's been fascinating to have you here. It's so interesting to learn from you guys and okay. really okay. dig down into these issues and, 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 and bring that out into the audience. Mm. Thank you very much for taking the time to do an interview. Thank you. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for the great interview. <laughs>